from Pierce Aerospace. Hi, Aaron. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Kim? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for speaking to me today. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, love drones, love aviation, came, uh, you know, those, those types of loves and joys in my life kind of collided a few years ago and I uh, had the opportunity to do something, uh, you know, crazy and start a company with a few other co-founders right out of grad school. So um, the, the way that we, we got into this was I was, uh, I was in grad school doing uh, GIS and remote sensing, and our geography department started a drone research center to mostly do, you know, remote sensing with drones, but they had absolutely no aviation experience or background. Um, while in you know high school through college, I volunteered with a, a civilian organization here in Indiana that restored and then flew Huey helicopters. So I took my experience as a Huey air crew member and an EMT with that organization and helped write the policy and ops manuals for the university. Started networking pretty heavily at the time. Um, got to know a lot of people in the industry and you know, I, I saw that I, I definitely had a little bit more of, I, I didn't know what it was at the time, but had more of that entrepreneurial spirit than, an, you know, an academic one. Um, absolutely love the academics, but I love the speed of entrepreneurship. So I uh, decided, hey, you know, this is right time, right place. Let's, let's dive into this and see what happens. And we, we just got after it and met a few folks along the way that you know, brought in as co-founders. And then, um, you know, originally we were look, working on log booking systems, but we had a strong focus on identification for the, you know, our differentiator for that. And as we were doing this, we kept seeing this need for answering the question of, you know, who is that in the airspace from a, you know, regulatory perspective, from a security perspective, from a defense perspective. And we started to put some things together and then really dove hard into the um, rem what is now remote ID. Right. So, yeah. So tell us about Pierce Aerospace and how you specialize in this remote ID uh, system and what it is, I guess. Yeah. So we make uh, a couple different products for in, in the remote ID realm. Um, one of them is we, we make a, a Beacon product uh, called the B1. Here, I should have had this out sooner. I'll pull one out. Um, it's a uh, it's a remote ID beacon, aftermarket beacon that can bring a drone and the pilot into compliance with FAA rules and regulations that require that um, nearly all Part 107 operations, nearly all operations in drones from you know 250 grams to 55 pounds, uh, squawk their identification. So uh, this is uh, our the first product we took to market. We'd worked on remote ID for years in uh, DOD in a DOD setting, um, going back to 2018 when we first started contracting with the U.S. Air Force on remote identification, and you know through that military heritage of really building this out, really diving into a lot of the R&D, we came up with these uh, relatively high performance products that weigh only 30 grams and can fit on just about any drone that's out on the market. Uh, we even took into account the vision, the anti-collision systems on some of the drones. So we shaped the product so it could actually fit on the majority of the drones that are out there uh, without upsetting the drone, that it had this extra payload attached to it. And that we launched uh, a little over a year ago now. We've had you know tremendous customer success with that, um, gotten it, you know, tested and run through the ringer in both uh, commercial, private sector, and government tests, and it came out on top every time. And then the other product line that we work on, which is harder for me to show just from my desk, but that is a remote ID receiver, a sensor that we, we manufacture that passively monitors the airspace for those remote identification messages. Um, it, it's, it takes that information in and we can then route that data uh, about the airspace into unmanned traffic management systems, into counter UAS systems, into command and control systems, into any client side um, system that needs to have awareness of what's going on in the airspace. 
So that um, that product's really fun. We, you know, again, worked heavily on the government R&D side of this, uh, developing the technologies through SBIRs, STTRs, and then our own internal funding as well, and come in, came up with a product that works really well and something that we saw that showed a lot of promise and got to confirm that promise through some uh, government deployments of our systems at, um, in situations like the Super Bowl, where we were able to successfully secure the airspace, help secure that airspace as one of the systems that's in play. And along the lines of doing this over several years, we really saw that our niche on where we fit in the market with these types of systems is as a fundamental piece of the next generation of airspace infrastructure. And that allows us to have a relatively affordable system that focuses on remote identification detections and can work with other systems, other companies, other technologies to kind of stack that to help uh, us and our, our colleagues in the industry work with the customer to really develop a total solution that meets the needs of that airspace and the, those customers um, you know, whether it be policy operations or some other type of, uh, you know, budgetary needs, constraints, or rules that they have to fall within. Right. And can you talk on the beacon side, can you talk about how um, that capability that you held up, the remote ID um, sensor, yeah. how that's different than a traditional squawk box in a, you know, a traditional aircraft and kind of why your technology is needed these or these days or, you know, um, in the, this next generation of air traffic and airspace, um, obviously we'll, we'll be using a different um, altitude of airspace, but can you talk about all that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, several years ago when this was being really dug into, there were significant concerns about the performance of ADSB in the, the use with, uh, with drones, because there's so many drones that are out there. There are concerns about there being saturation of the frequency, saturation um, about you know how this would work, weight, power, all of those things, and cost as well. And so it kind of came down to a um, a compromise for focusing on Wi-Fi and Bluetooth advertising technology for being able to answer that question of who is that when a drone's in the air. And we know it was a good compromise because almost no one was happy. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we really dug into this, really exercised the technology, really, really started to, you know, peel the onion back and, um, you know, saw that this, hey, this stuff works and it's possible and started to stress test it in some of those military environments and some of those, you know, Homeland Security style um, environments. And, you know, we built this thing, our, we, we come from the Indiana IOT lab in Indiana, that's kind of a, a fostering of entrepreneurship and hard tech in, in the state. And because of that, we actually built these in one of the noisiest environments that we, we find on a daily basis, because it's a, an IOT lab, there's a few signals going on in that place. And you know, building inside of that type of an environment to make a product that actually works was really valuable for us in terms of basically constructing the product inside of a hostile, you know, RF environment, not true hostile, but incredibly congested and noisy. So it was a great uh, place to, you know, forge a product for this space and then exercise that with our government customers so that when it came time to spin it out and commercialize it, we were able to be pretty successful with what we were doing with the product. Right, sure. And all of this is to support this burgeoning, at least partly, yes. uh, the urban air mobility industry. Can you talk about what that is, the coming quad cop copters? And for those of a certain age, you know, the Jetsons, uh, you know, pod zooming around um, and other types of unmanned air aerial vehicles. Can you talk about that a bit? Absolutely. So, you know, there's urban air mobility, advanced air mobility, whatever you call it, all of this, these new entrants and new capabilities coming into the airspace. Uh, it's an incredibly exciting time. And someone asked me not too long ago about, they, they asked, when will drones be mainstream? And 
I, you know, I kind of chuckled a little bit on our side because we get to see what's coming today. We, we see what's out there in the present. And we've started to see, I mean, we see drones flying every single day in every type of airspace, urban, suburban, agricultural. And the thing for us that went, you know, here, here's the inflection point. This is mainstream now was when we were observing out in the Midwest at an airport that's, as uh, our friends on the East or West Coast would say, in the sticks. And we're seeing two agricultural flights being conducted simultaneously in adjacent fields from one another. But based on where the operators were located, we're, we're about 95% certain they had no idea that the other drone and the other operator was there. And we're seeing this in rural America and, you know, in wide spaces where you, you'd think you wouldn't see that stuff. And that's starting to become a more regular type of observation that we're making from our sensors. So, you know, when I think of this next generation of airspace, it, it's that, and it's also making sure that all of that volume of air traffic that we're seeing from, from drones can cooperate safely with what we're seeing in traditional or more, um, you know, as we know it today, mainstream general aviation, and, you know, fixed wing helicopters that are in those low altitudes, ag flights that are, that are occurring in those low altitudes, and the new entrants that are coming in as well with some of the EV toll technology and EV toll aircraft that are coming into the airspace, such as, you know, not picking anyone out in particular, but such as Joby, Beta, you know, companies that are building aircraft like that. And all of this coming together and working to achieve safety requires us to be able to see where everyone's at, make sure that we can deconflict and make sure that air that airspace can still be utilized while we're integrating these new entrants. And the one thing with remote ID that we saw going back into 2017 was when we pivoted to focus on this was that this technology is one of the um, lower cost and, you know, lower resistance types of things to be able to incorporate into the aircraft that are out there so that we can have at least again, that fundamental base layer of both infrastructure as well as onboard aircraft capability to broadcast and say, hey, here I am uh, to the rest of those aircraft that need to have some insight into, and situational awareness about what's going on in the airspace. And when that harmonization happens, and it's, it won't be just through remote ID, but remote ID is a, a very effective, low cost ability to build on top of with, you know, layer those other technologies in there, Re redundancy and layering of of safety is good and encouraged and is what keeps aviation safe. And, you know, as, as we continue to layer those things together, we're going to start to see a really interesting convergence of those new entrants with the aircraft that have already been up there and start to see what I think is going to be kind of a new golden era of aviation, um, not just in the United States, but around the world. And I get super excited about that. Um, you know, and I, I, I think about this stuff as, you know, someone who, who had that, you know, more traditional upbringing through uh, rotor wings and flying something that, you know, flying in something that was built in 1968 to looking at some of the new aircraft that are being rolled out and seeing how we can kind of mesh these, these uh, various generations of aviation together to bring in that that new golden era right i love that the golden age of aviation and it's hard to picture but our skies will look a bit different um you know we're all used to you know airplanes taking off you know going up to ten thousand feet at you know cruising altitude and then going you know higher for longer flights can you talk about kind of what's happening with the faa you know they've obviously traditionally regulated air traffic you know it from traditional aircraft you know, with the ADSB systems, but and I know you've followed very followed very closely, kind of, and participated in the FAA developments to regulate this airspace and the, and the different aircraft that will be kind of you know in the lower altitudes. Can you talk about what's going on with the FAA now and what's the state of the regulations and and all that? Thanks. Fantastic question, and there's a lot that we could unpack here. <laughs> 
Um, now the the FAA is uh, they just got the reauthorization, so that that's fantastic. I know there was you know new funds in there for things like AIP, um, and you know I, I think Congress and the FAA both are sharing an urgency of making sure that we can safely get to the integration of all of these new entrants into the into the airspace system. Um, one of the things that I recently worked on with FAA and with industry colleagues on was the Detection and Mitigation Advanced Rulemaking Committee. And that was, you know, we've got all these new entrants that are coming in and we've got a lot of work that's going on on the safety side of things, but we also have the concerns on the security side of things as well. And I think that FAA interaction with the other U.S. government agencies that help perform the security mission is one of the crucial and key things to keep an eye on for us getting to widespread adoption and widespread, um, you know, further integration into the airspace, both from the safety perspective and the security, because they're they're cousins and they they go you know skipping hand in hand. Um, there there's already inherent things that we've put in place over the last few decades to make sure that commercial aviation is unquestionably secure and unquestionably safe. And I think the the next evolutions that will occur when we think about the security of some of this um, is very interesting to watch because we know that this is something that we'll have to get um, from a policy standpoint uh, brought out across the whole of the United States with law enforcement at that state, local, tribal, and territorial level as well. And that's going to be a very new thing to do, both for the agency as well as for the, uh, you know, the DHS, DOJ um, uh, operators out there as well. And having all of that work together with, you know, kind of working off the same sheet of music is something that I think is absolutely a regulation and a policy standpoint to get to to enable those beyond visual line of sight flights that can do wonderful things for you know medical delivery, um, you know or, or emergency use cases, uh, as well as the you know airdropping some chunky monkey ice cream to you on a on a hot summer day like we're experiencing. Now. Um, it, that same sheet of music is needed for both of those types of sets, and getting that right, getting that evolved, getting that music dispersed so that, you know, from federal to, to local, we're conducting the same song. I think that'll be key to helping get to the public's acceptance of what is now mainstream and will only be continuing to grow. And I think that's the most, at least from my perspective, I think that's one of the more fascinating pieces to watch from a policy and a regulatory development stance that is coming out of the FAA. Right, sure. Yeah, thanks for walking through that. And I'd love to kind of ask you as an entrepreneur, um, kind of how you got started. You mentioned, you know, the ideas coming out of grad school and that you had been, you know, a Huey pilot and an EMT. Crew member. Can you talk about, oh, crew member. Okay. Um, Flew it a couple times. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Under supervision from an IP. Right. <laughs> um, can you talk about kind of what it was like to get started in those first, you know, maybe a couple of years of, of, you know, putting a company together, you know, what's that like? And, and, and I guess, how were you able to stomach all that and, and be brave and just go for it? So I think probably the best part was that I knew almost nothing getting into it. <laughs> oh, so, uh, you know, I, and I, I guess I, I didn't realize that um, I was maybe a little bit more personality driven towards entrepreneurship than once I got into it after a few years. But it is, you know, dove into it knowing nothing, hadn't had a single business class or business schooling or, or you know, education tr in a traditional sense from that perspective. And I think that was okay. And probably, I don't know about better, but it was, it was fine. It was, it's a place that I encourage anyone who's ever thought of entrepreneurship to just start the, you know, the, the best way to do it is by following Nike's classic mantra of just do it. 
And that's what we, that's, that's what I, kind of the mantra that I took and dove into with. And, you know, along the way had great opportunities to meet wonderful people and be open and humble and willing to take input and advice and mentorship and really cultivated um, building that entrepreneurial education through mentorship. And, you know, in, in 2017, got, you know, got to have some conversations with U.S. Air Force and tech stars, and then got invited to come in and work as an entrepreneur and resident at the first U.S. Air Force accelerator program, where I, it was a heavy, heavy on engineering, uh, heavy technical founders in there. And I came in from more of a BD background and BD side and worked, um, that angle with all those founders while continuing to work on Pierce Aerospace at the same time and really got a tremendous education in entrepreneurship and startups through that. Uh, I, I, I kind of joke and say that a, a tech startups experience is like a crash course in getting a, an MBA in how to do startups uh, in a very condensed amount of time. And that was one of those you know, key inflection points that really you know, changed who I was and really launched us on a much more educated path to entrepreneurship. And, you know, later in 2018, we, we won our first SBIR through, um, through the Air Force as well, and got to, you know, really start to understand the government um, business model, the government small business bu business model to really drive through and evolve from that, you know, time in 2018 to, you know, I, I, I honestly don't think that you can learn everything government wise when it comes to doing business with government um, in a lifetime. But if you can learn those special, specialized pieces that you need to be successful for your business, uh, I think some of those, you know, points like engaging with tech stars in that accelerator program and then taking in the mentorship from folks who had done it before and successfully built companies and sold them and grown them through that SBIR track, the small business innovation research track. Uh, I think that's crucial. And we, we started there and have just continued to learn and grow as the process has gone. And, you know, we're happy to share today that we've, you know, done the full gamut of phase one to two to phase three contracting with us government customers and, you know, we've engaged and had on contract or, in, you know, in signed and MO, written MOUs and participating in those contracts, 11 different U.S. government agencies at this point, um, which has been fantastic. And that's just on the SBR track. We were able to capture others as well, just selling direct with the beacon uh, that we, we produced. Right, sure. And can you talk a little bit about um, any partnerships that you formed along the way and, and what was that like and kind of any lessons learned um, if, if you want to offer any from that side of things? Yeah. So, you know, early on, we and again, we, we knew that our receiver products, these are our capturing data we need to integrate into other systems that other people have built. So partnership and cooperation was you know, testament to the the success of the business and, and driving forward. So we've always been very open about that and very willing to work with others. And we we didn't expect this one early on, but we actually got some of the big primes to be open and willing to work with us um, early on. And you know, this this may be a you know your your experience may vary based on what you're doing and the type of company and the different divisions within those primes you're working with, but we got to meet some of the folks at Northrop Grumman and really developed a good relationship with them to the point where we, we actually worked with them to develop the first ever internally funded mentor protege program in the company's history. And we took that, you know, mentor protege type of partnership that the, the official one that SBA has and kind of modeled what that would look like for Pierce Aerospace and Northrop Grumman to work together so that we could get educated a little bit better while at the same time integrating into some of their counter UAS um, systems and solutions. And we, we really worked you know, wonderfully there to uh, both learn and then test and prove this technology in live fire experimentations for US government customers and evaluators. 
And that was another, you know, early part that we were really excited and proud about in terms of the evolution of where this small business has come from. Right. And what's next for Pierce Aerospace? What should we be on the lookout for? <laughs> um, what's next? So here, we'll, we'll share it here for the first time. So we haven't been public with it. It's not on the website yet. But we we have a next generation of our receiver line that has actually been out and been in testing uh, for several months now, collecting data. And we are very excited to um, you know, go a little bit more mainstream with that one here in the near future. But you know, we, we've been out collecting data for both government and commercial sector customers and been really pleased with what we've seen so far with the performance of you know, how remote ID is working from the OEMs that have implemented it effectively and with how that's working when we think about infrastructure systems and how we work to iterate on that next generation of technologies to help make the airspace both safe and secure. So we're really excited to, to see that. And uh, you know, those, those systems that have been out there are giving informing us a lot about what the next production versions of what we go to market will be are. And we are very excited to share those with, uh, with everyone as the time approaches. Oh yeah, that's very exciting to have that next generation of receivers out there. That's so great. And I know you do obviously a lot of work in the U.S. And you, um, are you working outside of the U.S. Um, globally or internationally or in the U.K. or any other countries? We have some international engagement. I can't share that just yet, though. Sure. And those but are all my questions. Happy to, hopefully soon. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. I'll be all ears. <laughs> um, anything of else, Aaron, you want yeah, to the, yeah, highlight? Or... I'd say the... The other thing that's really been rewarding as we've been going with, especially, you know, from our co-founders as we've, as we've grown the company is we, we've really developed a, a strong internship program over here. And this is probably the thing we're most excited about this entire summer so far, not, not just a product release, but um, we, we we'll joke and say we, we have an intern or a, uh, uh, an entrepreneur release now because we've had our interns that have stayed with us for the past couple of years to start their own companies now. And, you know, it's been really exciting to learn and have, you know, the leaders on our team get mentored and now see, you know, interns that are coming out of high school from our internship program and coming out of college from our internship program and turning into entrepreneurs as well. So we uh, we hope to do more of that, and if we if we're good at anything, we want to be best at that because I think that is um, super exciting in helping to mentor and bring that next generation of entrepreneurship out there. So um, I can't wait to share some more of that when uh, when they're ready to come out of stealth mode. Ah, uh, very cool. Yeah, and it's that's not very common for entrepreneurs to, you know, they're usually focused on their product and building the company and, but to, you know, help mint future entrepreneurs, you know, that's something else. That's amazing. Yeah. If we're building team and building our people, then I know that whatever the products are that come out are going to be great and fantastic. And, you know, they'll be great if the people that we're building are great as well. So we're, we're always thinking about how to grow and how to make sure that we're fostering a wonderful culture of, of building here inside the company. Right, sure. And I, I think I first learned about your company, I think back in 2020 during COVID when um, the Air Force AppWorks was launching their Agility Prime program. I think that's where I first learned about you all. Um, but I really appreciate it over the years you know, you were one of the people who helped me learn about the urban mobility market and what that was going to look like and the need for, you know, having this ID, um, you know, remote sensing ID. So things can be identified that are flying around in the air and, and then on the receiver side. So I've, I've appreciated watching your company grow and also, you know, being able to learn from you. I thank you for that for all that knowledge so well we appreciate you uh you know being there with us as we as we've grown and helping us to share the story with fca you know we've gotten fantastic engagement with fca over the time as well and 
um, yeah, I, I think it was Agility Prime when we first met and okay. we, uh, <laughs> it's funny, I, we always joke that we were the most boring thing in all of Agility Prime. So I, uh, I, I texted my mom one night when it, some of the Agility Prime, some of the aircraft companies were getting featured on 60 Minutes and I said, hey, that, that Air Force program that we uh, we got contracted into is getting featured on 60 Minutes, and she got super excited. And I was like, no, 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 it's not us. We're the boring stuff. It's the all the shiny new uh, new aircraft are being featured, but um, you know, we're we're happy to be the boring thing that helps to support all of those uh, more exciting things in the airspace. Because um, I find that very fulfilling and rewarding to be you know a part of the the back end no one knows about, but you know, I want there to be a whole bunch of these cool things so I can hop inside of them at some point. Uh, so uh, that that's where we're motivated at is, you know, <laughs> please, you know, help those industry partners get get a airspace infrastructure in place so they can fly and do all sorts of cool stuff. Right. Well, it's very cool that you're helping, you know, be foundational to that kind of data and that information and kind of security in the airway. So that's awesome. Yeah. Anything else? I think that's all I've got for today. I really appreciate it, Cam. And thank you for anyone who's stuck with us to uh, to listen to us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much, Arian. Thanks for your time. Mm -hmm.